I think everyone knows that Mewtwo's good. Like, really good. After all, these are its stats. It has 154 special attack and 130 speed. Also, its other stats aren't bad either. After beating the game with Rayquaza, I figured I should also beat the game with Mewtwo to get another data point for potentially the fastest completion time. For Mewtwo, I decided to start with a rash nature, boosting its special attack and lowering its special defense. After all, Mewtwo has weaknesses to bug, ghost, and dark type moves. Two of those types are physical types, so I didn't want to lower my physical defense. Plus, of the Elite Four members, Sydney is generally the weakest. However, dark types are going to be an issue, but not in the late game. They're going to be an issue right now. You see, Mewtwo starts with Confusion and Disable, so it has no moves that can damage dark types. Because I don't know these games very well, I run into the first trainer on Route 102, and he sends his Puchiana into battle. Well, uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> With 25 PP of Confusion and 20 PP of Disable, I don't think that I'm gonna get to struggle to knock this thing out. I try for it, because Mewtwo is really strong after all, but in the end, the small dog knocks my legendary cat out. So Mewtwo learns Barrier at level 11 and Swift at level 22, so it's quite unrealistic to knock this Puchiana out in a fair fight. The best way to get by this obstacle is to train against Pokemon in the wild and deplete all my PP of Confusion and Disable. Then I can use Struggle against the Puchiana, so yeah, this is gonna take a little while. By the way, you might wonder why not just use potions to heal Mewtwo and try to spam out all of its PP against the Puchiana in that way. Well, check out my rules, they're in the description, but in short, I can only use my starter in battle, I can't use any items in battle, I'm not allowed to use game-breaking glitches or exploits, and I'm also not allowed to use the TM for double team until my Pokemon gets to level 100. So while I'm fighting wild Pokemon in preparation for the Puchiana, let's talk about Mewtwo's move pool. Through level up, most of its incredible moves require it to be at a high level. Psychic needs level 66, Amnesia needs level 77, and Recover needs level 88. Because Rayquaza finished the game at level 60, I don't think that Mewtwo is going to get to any of these moves today, but I think it should be fine because through TMs and HMs it has so much coverage. It learns moves like Water Pulse, Calm Mind, Ice Beam, Solar Beam, Thunderbolt, Earthquake, Return, Psychic, Shadow Ball, Brick Break, Flamethrower, and Aerial Ace. Since I have everything I need, I'm going to give Mewtwo perfect IVs today. That means that its hidden power type will be Dark. While I'm training, I just want to mention that my Mewtwo's nickname is Luna. Once again, I nicknamed Cat Pokemon after this adorable neighborhood cat that constantly visits me and my fiancé. It's kind of sad now because it's winter, so she's around a lot less. But that's good, she needs to stay at her home and keep warm. Now that I have Struggle, Mewtwo does so much damage to the Puchiana and I knock it out in two hits. However, I'm not past all the Dark types yet because the Team Aqua Grunt in Petalburg Woods has another Puchiana. So I don't heal in the Pokemon Center in Petalburg City just so that I can continue using Struggle. In Rustboro City, I'm finally through all the annoying early game Dark types so I can finally heal and use Confusion. I decide to go for Roxanne right away, after all Mewtwo's very strong. I'll just note here that this playthrough was also filmed a while ago, so the power that displays in the bottom center is only incorporating type effectiveness, and it's not calculating the same type attack bonus, item boosts, or weather. Roxanne starts with Geodude. I figure that level 8 would be enough for Mewtwo to win this fight, because rock Pokemon do not have very much special defense. Looks like it was a good call. My level 8 Mewtwo one-hits Geodude with confusion. Oh. Okay, that was a critical hit, maybe the second one will survive, and it does, with orange health giving it time to use Rock Tomb, which does a quarter and lowers Mewtwo's speed. My second confusion takes it out and Roxanne sends in her ace, nose pass. This thing has pretty decent special defense, and as a result Mewtwo's confusion only does what looks like a fifth to it. Rock Tomb hits, taking me under half, but Mewtwo eats its berry and continues to attack. One issue in this fight is that Roxanne has two potions and nose pass is holding an Oran berry. That gives the nose pass the sustain it needs, and it knocks Mewtwo out. So this has been a bumpy start so far. A reset on a Puchiana, and then a reset here against Roxanne. Fighting her at level 8 is probably not advisable again, however I'm gonna give it a try. There's one detail about how the fight went last time that did make the nose pass significantly harder to knock out. Remember that I crit the first Geodude? Yeah, that means Roxanne saved one of her potions for the nose pass. Without a critical hit, she uses one on the first Geodude, and then she uses a second potion on the second Geodude. So by the time Nose Pass comes out, she's got no potions left. I think if I had a different Pokemon going into this battle at level 8, the experience would level that Pokemon up a few more times, but Mewtwo only reaches level 10 by the end of the fight. That's because it has a slow growth rate. But levels aren't all Mewtwo needs. 
It's also going to need a way to hit dark types. In Rust Turf Tunnel, I have to defeat the Team Aqua member who has a Puchiena. It's really lucky that the prize for beating Roxanne is the TM for Rock Tomb. I teach it to Mewtwo right away, and now I can take the Puchiena out. Backtracking through Rustboro City, I decide to face Mei as well. Check this out, the uh, first Pokemon on her team is a Torkoal. I genuinely did not know that she has this thing. Turns out, it's probably a programming error, because in every battle after this, she has a Slugma. Pretty sure she's supposed to have a Slugma here too. It's also worth noting that she only has this Torkoal if you chose Torchic as your starter. If you chose Trico or Mudkip as your starter, then her team never contains a Torkoal. I know Gen 1 gets a lot of flack for being very broken and programmed terribly, and there's so many mistakes in the game. So it's nice finding one in Generation 3 as well. I take the boat to Duford, catch myself a Magikarp, name it Bruno, and then I head into Brawly's gym. So, uh, what can we expect from Brawly? He's probably going to be really easy, right? Right? Yeah, he's going to be really easy. You 2 one hits the Machop, two hits the Metatite, remember it can't attack because it only has Focus Punch, and then Confusion one-shots the Makuhita as well. I deliver the letter to Steven, and then I head to Slateport City where I have to face more dark types in the museum. In Generation 1, it really feels like the Poison type was meant to be the evil type, felt like they made the Poison type as bad as possible, like everything is good against Poison types. And then in Generation 3, it really feels like they make the dark types here as bad as possible too. Mewtwo now has the moves that it needs, so it can get through these dark types with ease. I grab Paralyzed Heels, head north, and then face Mei again. As you can see in this fight, she leads with Lombre. At this point, I've taught Mewtwo bulk up so that I can use it to set up. Honestly, I don't think I really need to for this fight. I should have probably just tried to sweep. After a little setup, I take the Lombre down. The Marsh Tomp is next. Funnily enough, it isn't taking very much damage from Confusion. Looks like only a third. That's probably because Mewtwo is only level 17 at this point. I did skip a bunch of the early game trainers, and that's because I filmed this playthrough a long time ago. I knock her ace out and move on to Slugma. See, no Torkoal in this fight. I think we need to invent some amazing lore to explain away this programming error. So why do you think Mei chose to not take her Torkoal on the rest of the journey with her? Why was Slugma the superior choice? North of Mauville City, I defeat the Windstraits and earn myself the Macho Brace. By the way, I read all of your comments on my previous videos and I now know that this item halves your speed when you use it. With that out of the way, I'm now ready to face Watson. Voltorb is first, and I realize here that I forgot to heal. So, Confusion doesn't have very much PP left. Okay, well, I can set up Bulk Up and use Swift instead. Taking time to do this isn't great because the Voltorb paralyzes me with Spark, and I use my Cherry Berry up. Also, the Voltorb actually does a lot of damage before I finally take it out. Mewtwo only has 18 hit points left now. I one-hit the Electric, and then Watson sends in his Intimidating Magneton. Even with my setup, I'm not able to do enough, and it takes me out. So, that's my third reset. However, after I've healed, I come back into the fight, and now I can make it to the Magneton significantly healthier. Unfortunately though, the Magneton doesn't take very much damage from Confusion because it resists it. As a result, I get paralyzed after my Cherry Berry, and now my speed's cut for the Manectric. First turn, it goes for Howl, raising its attack, and Mewtwo can't move because of Paralysis. It howls again, and Confusion hits, doing less than half. Electric strikes back with Shockwave, but Mewtwo survives, and my next Confusion rolls better damage and takes it out. So this playthrough has been a lot bumpier than I expected, like, it's going very smoothly overall, like, normally Watson walls me for way longer, but I would have expected Mewtwo to just, like, be a little bit more consistent, at least until this point. While I'm heading north, I grab the TM for secret power, and I pick up some berries, destroying the environment in the process because I don't plant them back. I know it's a kid's video game, but every time I don't replace the barriers, I'm just like, oh no. What about all the people in the area who need to get these berries? They're like, they're not going to have any next time they come here because I just took them all. I take a gondola ride, no hiker shows up today, and then I go head to head with Maxi. Now, he has a dark type lead. It's really good that I have Swift by this point, but it's annoying that Mightyena has Intimidate. To get around this, I teach Mewtwo Shockwave, and I use it to knock the Mightyena out. By the way, Shockwave is essentially an electric type Swift, so even though Mightyena lowered my accuracy with Sand Attack, I'm still going to be able to land every hit. It's super effective against the following Zubat, so I take it out in a single hit, and then it's time for the camera. Confusion's obviously going to do the most damage here, so I go for it despite my accuracy being lowered. It hits, doing half, and camera strikes back with Ember, which does very little. My next Confusion does miss, but Maxi only uses Focus Energy, and then he finishes Ace off. So how's Flannery going to be? 
Well, my slow growth rate in combination with the fact that I haven't fought very many trainers means that her lead Nummel isn't a one hit with Confusion. Like, I'm really wishing that I had learned Psybeam or something by now. Like, come on, Confusion's very bad. It's starting to become apparent now that Mewtwo only having access to this weak Psychic-type move does hold its potential back. By this point, Rayquaza had access to Dragon Claw, which is much, much better. Things get even worse, though, because the Slugma survives a single hit and poisons Mewtwo as a result. Her Camerupt follows and uses Overheat, taking me down to 17 hit points. After poison damage is applied, I only have 14 hit points left for the Torkoal, and it's a defensive beast. It survives my confusion with more than half health and finishes Mewtwo off. So I lost again, and it's starting to become clear that Mewtwo is struggling in most of the major battles, like with the exception of Brawly, he was inspired by Bruno today. However, one way to get around the level deficit is by using a setup move. The Nummel's not particularly intimidating, it's definitely not Mightyena, so I can set up against it with bulk up. I get all the way to plus 5 before the Nummel takes me to orange health, and now I should probably start my sweep. To sweep, I'm going to use secret power because it has 10 more base power over swift, and that's hopefully going to be enough to get through all of her team. Plus, on this terrain, this move has a 30% chance to paralyze the opponent, which could be very clutch if the Torkoal survives. But will it survive? And the answer is yes. I don't get paralysis, it uses overheat, and that knocks Mewtwo out. In the next battle, I don't get as lucky early on, and I have to move into the rest of the fight with low health and a meager two turns of setup. But maybe this will be okay, because I'm just going to two hit the Torkoal anyways. I paralyze the camera up to knock it out, but Secret Power isn't even doing half to her ace now. So, that's another loss. I do manage to get set up fully in the next fight, but still the Torkoal is able to survive. He uses Overheat, and that gives it the win. There's a trend starting to emerge against Flannery in these videos. By the way, spoilers if you haven't watched any of my other Emerald videos. With Absol, I only won because the Torkoal missed an Overheat. And then, with Shift Tree, the exact same scenario played out. And I'm starting to wonder if this is what Mewtwo is going to need as well. However, in this case, Secret Power does half. It doesn't choose Overheat, instead opting for Body Slam, which is a weird choice, considering I've set up Bulk Up four times. It does paralyze Mewtwo, but my next Secret Power still hits, and that's it. I've defeated Flannery. Although, I have to say, I'm not particularly happy with the way I needed to do it. I long for a playthrough where she's extremely easy to defeat. I backtrack through the desert, into the middle of the map, grabbing strength on my way and reuniting two lovers. Then I head through Rustboro City into the forest so that I can finally face Norman. When I was filming this, I hadn't yet learned to fear Spinda, so I decided to set a bulk up against it. As a result, Mewtwo gets confused and hits itself. Even despite the confusion, I continue to set up, which is just objectively a bad choice. Mewtwo snaps out of it, I continue to set up, get confused again, and then finally I decide to attack. Like, what was I thinking here? At least Secret Power hits and knocks the Spinda out. However, because of my bad choices against his lead, Norman is able to defeat me. One thing I find really interesting about playing these challenges is that when you start a new generation, learning occurs very quickly at the beginning. Less than a month after filming this, I'm already looking back and seeing major mistakes everywhere. Like I really should have fought all of the trainers on the early routes, and I shouldn't be setting up bulk up, instead I should just rely on Mewtwo's special attack. Also for a nature, I probably should have chosen a mild nature to boost my special attack and lower my physical attack. In the next fight, I'm being stubborn, and I continue trying to set up, but this time it works out, I get plus six, and with it, Mewtwo's able to one-shot all of Norman's Pokemon. Even the slacking. With his badge, I'm now able to use Surf. I catch myself a Wingle so I can use Fly later on. After that, I backtrack through the middle of the map again. There's so much backtracking in Emerald. Here, I grab the Trickmaster's Rare Candy and the Rare Candy on the island outside of his house. Then, I head into New Mauville, do the generator stuff, and Watson gives me the TM for Thunderbolt as a result. On my way to Fort Tree City, I run into Steven. I really like in the Pokemon games how they always made a priority to show you the champion throughout the playthrough, and then when you see them in the league, it feels very important. In this case, though, that's sort of undermined in Emerald because you're not seeing Wallace here, you're seeing Steven, and he's not the champion anymore. Like, honestly, Wallace just shows up when things get really bad in the story line and he like walks around and doesn't really do anything yeah uh if emerald has one problem it's the fact that wallace is the champion however that does mean that i have to face steven in the post game and uh for pokemon challenges that is a much more engaging way for the game to play out 
because he's very hard in that battle. Also, I just want to mention when Steven runs away from you here, like, where is he going? Did he just, like, come down from Fortree City and then, like, walk over here and go, like, ah, no, I actually need to go the other way, and then he, like, turns around and goes back down this route. Like, I don't know what's happening. This is, like, how I navigate the overworld. And then when you find him later on, he's, like, back where he started, at Fortree City, sitting on a bridge beside a Kecleon. I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Now, in all Pokemon games, there are battles which are supposed to feel like major encounters, but they feel more like encounters with Bruno. In Generation 1, Giovanni and Sylph is one of these battles, as well as all of the battles against Team Rocket, like Jesse and James, I mean, unless you're playing with Parasect, that is. In Generation 3, the fight against the Aqua Admin in the Weather Institute, and then the following battle against your rival, have the feeling of being letdowns. I'm sure this rival battle is more challenging when you're just running through the game and playing regularly, but in a solo playthrough, it is really not impactful. Even as a kid, I always wondered why the developers didn't give your rival a fully evolved starter for this fight. Like, it could be a higher level, I think that would be fine. In Fortree City, I grab the Hidden Power TM, just east of the city I pick up the Rare Candy, and then on the bridge I help Steven deal with the Kecleon problem. So in the previous case he ran away to like guide me up here so that I could do his work for him. Yeah, thanks a lot Steven, this is obviously champion tier behavior. Now let's talk about game design, specifically puzzle design in Winona's Gym. This is something that Game Freak doesn't really seem interested in anymore. I love these little puzzles. Like, I don't really know what to call these things. Like, like they're like sort of like those door things you have to go through in like a subway to get through, but like, not really. Anyways, I find this puzzle really engaging. It's a simple mechanic, and then they just let you figure it out. There's no like hand holding or anything, and if you can't get through it, you just like stumble around for a bit until you figure it out. I do realize that this isn't particularly hard once you have it figured out, but it does make you think a little bit, and I love that. In later generation games, I wish they had continued to explore how to create interesting puzzles for the player with basic mechanics mechanics. However, now it just seems like you have to walk around and press A a lot. With a small sense of accomplishment because I made it through this challenge, I make it to Winona. So, let's battle her. Swablu's first. I know it has Perish Song, so I knock it out right away with Thunderbolt. Because I defeated all the trainers in the gym, and I don't have an Aether, I don't have a lot of power points left over, so I use Confusion to knock the Tropius out. After all, it isn't very offensively intimidating. Next is Pelipper. Obviously it's going to use Protect on the first turn. I knock it out with Confusion, and then Skarmory's next. I've been saving my Thunderbolts just for this thing. Mewtwo has a beastly special attack stat, so finally I'm able to knock this thing out in a single hit. All that's left is Altaria, and while it does have the Dragon type, its secondary Flying type means that Thunderbolt deals neutral damage. I go for it, I get a lucky paralysis, but it doesn't look like I'm going to knock it out on the next turn. However, I score a critical hit, and with that, it's goodbye Winona. On my way to Lily Cove City, I spend some extra time at Mount Pyre because I want to pick up the TM for Shadow Ball. Remember these people? The guy with the purple hair has a Wobbuffet. I really want to make sure to avoid him. However, once again, as I'm about to walk down the ramp, he catches me. And now, we've got to roll some dice. I should either start saving right before I try to make it past him, or I should switch the game to one times speed so it's a bit easier to control. But uh, where's the fun in that? I use Secret Power, it does one third to the Wobbuffet, and strangely enough, it fails a Mirror Coat and just goes down. Okay, no resets here. With him out of the way, I pick up Shadow Ball, try to use an Escape Rope. Apparently these don't work in here. The reason is that Escape Ropes don't work in buildings, and Mount Pyre is, after all, a building. In Lily Cove City, I grab the TM for rest, and then I head to Fall Harbor City to grab the TM for return. At the end of the Magma Hideout, I have to face Maxi, Mighty Anna's first, and it isn't intimidating today because I am a special attacker. I knock it out with two Thunderbolts, the following Crobat gets one hit, and all that's left is Camerupt. I was pretty sure that Confusion wouldn't one hit, but it does. By the way, it's really annoying that I still have to use Confusion. The TM for Psychic is at Victory Road, or I could purchase it in the game corner, but I can't do that today because I didn't know about the amulet coin when I filmed this run, and I just won't have enough money. At least, that's what I thought when I was playing this run. I am going to explore in the future how I might be able to buy TMs at the game corner a little bit sooner in playthroughs. So stay tuned for that probably sometime in the new year. In the Team Aqua Hideout, we get to say hi to Matt. Cool vest, cool bandana thing. At least he's got his look down because uh, his skills in battle are not very impressive today. With that, it's time to take on Tate and Liza. They're typically the most challenging gym battle of the run. Some of you have suggested to me that I should duplicate my solo Pokemon and use two of them in this fight. 
Personally, I much prefer having my trusty companion Magikarp for this fight. I've taught Mewtwo Shadow Ball, and this generation makes Ghost-type moves deal physical damage. I cannot tell you how many times I have messed this up in videos. <laughs> like, specifically, Shadow Ball is a special-type move in later generations. So yeah, it's like, it really messes with my mind. Also, Ghost-type moves do not seem like they should be physical moves. Today, what this means is that I can use Bulk Up to improve Shadow Ball's damage, which is truly a weird interaction. Action. Thanks, fighting type move, for making my ghost type move better. <laughs> like, what? One of the reasons this works so well is because Zatu loves to set up Calm Mind over and over, and Mewtwo doesn't take very much damage from Claydol's Earthquake because Bulk Up is improving my defense. When I'm finally ready to attack, Shadow Ball 1 hits Zatu. I targeted it specifically because it had set up so much. Next, I take the Claydol out so it stops using Earthquake. From there, Lunatone falls to a single hit, and so does the Soul Rock. So Mewtwo beat Tate and Liza on its first attempt. Now that I'm further into the game, things are really starting to get a lot easier for this broken legendary. I head over to the Space Center next and do battle alongside Steven. This fight isn't hard today, so now Mewtwo's heading out to sea. I surf all the way over to Pacific Log Town, and then I take the rapids down and grab a rare candy. After that, I push a bunch of weird boulders and face Archie. Once again, it's another easy battle for Mewtwo. I watch some fun cinematics, and then I tackle the ice puzzles in Juan's gym. He leads with Love Disc, because he's bad. After Tate and Liza, I replaced Mewtwo's Bulk Up for Calm Mind, which is going to be so much more powerful. This is also a reason that I thought a rash nature was a good idea. After setting up with Calm Mind, my special defense is going to be really good anyways. After one turn, Juan confuses Mewtwo, I eat my Person Berry, and now it's time to sweep. Thunderbolt knocks the Love Disc and the Crawdont out in a single hit. He sends in Whiskash next, and I have to use Confusion to knock it out. Juan uses a Hyper Potion, saving it, and then Mewtwo gets a crit to knock it out. Celio goes down to one Thunderbolt, and that leads to his ace, Kingdra. Because it's raining, it moves first and gets set up with Double Team. If you didn't know, Juan's Kingdra has Swift Swim, which boosts its speed in the rain. Thunderbolt still connects on the next turn, but Kingdra survives on red, and Juan uses his second Hyper Potion. Next, Thunderbolt misses, and now I'm starting to get worried. I miss again, Juan goes for double team again, but then Thunderbolt hits. Unfortunately, it doesn't knock it out, Juan gets another double team in, so this is getting to the place where the player can no longer hit the AI's Pokemon, but luckily he used one of his Hyper Potions earlier on on the Whiskash. Because of that, he doesn't have another one to heal with, so when my next Thunderbolt hits, the Kingdra goes down. I'm lucky that I was able to win there. Before the leak, I have to defeat Wally, and with him out of the way, I make my way through Victory Road to Evergrande City. Anyone think that it's kind of weird that this city is one location on the map, but there's two fly points? This confused me so much as a kid until I figured it out. Before I fight the League, I want to do one last thing. I backtrack to the abandoned ship, pick up the TM for Ice Beam, and now I'm ready. Sydney's first, and this is really unfortunate because I just picked up the TM for Psychic, and right away it is not going to be useful. Because Sydney has grass types which resist Thunderbolts, I wanted to set up Calm Mind here, but the problem in doing that is that Mighty Anna can use Swagger and Sand Attack. The synergy on this thing's moveset is actually really interesting. Intimidate lowers your attack, then it sets up Sand Attack, you're more likely to miss, and then he uses Swagger, boosting your attack, but not too high since you've already been intimidated. Also, so the confusion is much better because you can miss, but you can also hit yourself in confusion. So yeah, it's like really interesting Pokemon. So Mewtwo is able to get through Sydney's first four Pokemon and arrive at his Absol. Here I have to use Shadow Ball because of Torment, and then after Swords Dance, the Absol goes for Slash, which finishes Mewtwo off. While I lose again, let me explain the pickle that I've got myself into. This happens a lot. I taught Mewtwo Psychic, after all, it's a Psychic type and this is the best Psychic type move, so like it just makes sense, but it's not very useful against Sydney. I want it for every other trainer, so I don't want to unlearn it to give Mewtwo a move that would be useful in this battle. What I really should have done is just held off on using it until I had defeated Sydney. In its place, I could have taught Mewtwo a move like Aerial Ace, which would have been so good here. It's going to be super effective against his grass types, and it will bypass accuracy checks, so moves like Sand Attack and Double Team will not be able to do anything. So in this case, I'm stuck using either Thunderbolt, which is resisted by the grass types, giving them time to set up either Torment or Double Team. Also, Shadow Ball is resisted, so I can't use that move instead. I don't want to delete it either because Phoebe's coming up next, and I'm going to use it against her. Obviously, I can't unlearn Calm Mind. It's probably Mewtwo's best move at this point. 
and Thunderbolt is going to be useful against Glacia and Wallace, so I want to keep it around two. So I guess I just need to keep trying, and as a result I lose two more times. Here's the thing though, I'm making a logical mistake. See, I'm trying to set up because I'm used to playing the game with really weak Pokemon or playing in Generation 1 where all setup moves are amazing, but Mewtwo is so strong already that if I just attack, I can knock the Mightyena out. By doing so, I avoid the annoying tactics of Swagger and Sand Attack, and then I can more consistently attack for the following Pokemon and knock them out as well. Shift Tree is a bit annoying because I can't two hit it, so I set up, hit twice, and from there I'm able to finally defeat Sydney. Phoebe's next. I really hope that Shadow Ball gives me the damage I need to defeat her Dusclops, but it uses Protect on the first turn, and on the second turn when Shadow Ball hits, it doesn't do enough to finish it off, and that allows Phoebe to set up Confuse Ray. Mewtwo hits itself once, and Dusclops uses Protect, and then I knock it out. Bayonet's next. Because it's weaker, I decide to use Thunderbolt so I don't run out of Shadow Ball PP. Unfortunately, the second Bayonet hits Mewtwo with Shadow Ball and does so much damage. I really should have just kept using my ghost move here, I think. As a result, Mewtwo goes down at her final dust claws. In the next fight, I have a slightly ironic realization. Mewtwo's Psychic does more damage to dust claws than Shadow Ball does. After all, Dusclops is a balanced defender, and Mewtwo has more special attack, plus it gets stabbed with a Psychic-type move. Psychic also one-hits the next two Bayonets. Phoebe sends out her Ace Dusclops, however, it's a higher level, so it survives, and that allows it to use Shadow Ball, taking Mewtwo to half. Last is Sableye. I click too fast and use Psychic, which doesn't work because it's a Dark-type. It sets up one turn of double team, I use Shadow Ball, which does about half, Mewtwo gets hit to orange, and then my next Shadow Ball misses, allowing Sableye to finish me off. Ah, that's disappointing. However, there's an even better solution for this fight. I can teach Mewtwo hidden power over Shadow Ball, and because I set my IVs to perfect values at the beginning, this is a 70 base power dark type attack. In Generation 3, damage category is determined by the move's type, so here this move uses Mewtwo's special attack. Using this, I'm able to quickly sweep through Phoebe's entire team, except the Sableye because it just barely survives. This thing has no weaknesses by the way, yeah it's really good, I should uh, use it in a playthrough soon. Phoebe's full restore can't save it, and as a result, it goes down. Glacia's next, and I thought that using Calm Mind to set up, and then using Thunderbolt or Psychic depending on her Pokemon, would be an easy win. What I didn't know, however, when I was filming this, is that the Celio knows Body Slam, and so it paralyzes Mewtwo, and that leads to one loss. Okay, let's try this again. Thing is, this Celio loves to set up Hail on the first turn, so it can use one Calm Mind and then knock it out with Thunderbolt. After that, Mewtwo is powerful enough that it can one-shot both of her Glalie, her Celio, and even her Wall Ring. For Drake, Hidden Power is no longer useful, so I teach Mewtwo Ice Beam in its place. Because Shelgon loves to use Protect first turn, I set up with Calm Mind. Well, let's try it twice, why not? Well, the reason is that this thing knows Rock Tomb, and it lowers Mewtwo's speed. Oh dear, this could be very bad. I knock it out with Ice Beam, and I still move first against the Flygon, but the Salamence moves first with Rock Slide. Strangely, it doesn't do very much to Mewtwo, and then I knock it out. I think here we're seeing the advantage that the player gets with badge boosts and EVs, which the opponent doesn't have access to. Altaria goes down to a single hit, and Kingdra is last. But here, I score a lucky critical hit, and I finish it as well. So I've made it all the way to the champion. Because Wallace really likes to use Toxic, I give Mewtwo a Pecha Berry for this fight. Whale Lord's first, and I decide to set up Calm Mind here since it would mean that Mewtwo could take less damage from his special attacks. Also, he likes to set up Rain Dance on the first turn, and here he does, so I correctly predicted that, and now I'm set up. Thunderbolt 1 hits the Whale Lord, Tentacruel's next, and it gets 1 hit too, which is a really good sign because it has great special defense. Of course, Ludicolo is next and it's gonna survive because this thing is such a troll and it actually does decent damage with Surf before it goes down. The Whiskers Fish tricks me and I accidentally use Thunderbolt against it. So many times as a kid I did this, I got incredibly frustrated. Like, look at it, it's a blue fish, it should get zapped by Thunderbolt. Come on, like, stop smiling at me, fish, you're, you're the worst. I guess I'll have to do a Wish Cash playthrough now, it seems like I'm playing all the Pokemon that I insult in this generation. Gyarados is next, Thunderbolt takes it out in a single hit, and now Wallace only has Milotic left. Here's the thing, it has a lot of special defense, and it survives Thunderbolt, and knocks me out with Surf. So, 
the Whiskash was responsible for this defeat. To ensure that I one hit the Milotic, I take a little bit of extra time and set up twice on the Wailord. This does come with a consequence because it hits me with Water Spout when it's at full health. At least it wasn't a rain boosted Water Spout. I speed through the rest of his team members, even the Whiskash, and make it back to the Milotic. This time, Thunderbolt 1 hits, and Mewtwo finishes the league with a time of 2 hours, 6 minutes, and 38 seconds. It had 18 resets, which is a bit surprising, but level 57 isn't. That's very low. If I just leveled up a bit more in the early portions of the game, I would have cut so many resets and made this much more consistent and fast. But the run isn't done yet because I still have to defeat Steven. Before that, I head into the game corner. I'll just note here that I haven't been spending much money throughout the playthrough, and you'll notice that I only have enough money to buy one TM. Because Steven is a steel type trainer, oh, oh my gosh, I just realized that like Steven sounds like steel and that's why his name is Steven. I don't know why, I always just fixated on the fact that his last name was Stone and I was like, well, like steel is kind of like a stone, right? <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't realize that. Anyways, here in the game corner, I buy the Flamethrower TM, I teach it to Mewtwo in the place of Thunderbolt, and now I'm ready to take on the most challenging trainer of the entire run and the region. Steven leads with Skarmory, and it's so nice to have Flamethrower to do super effective damage to this thing. But before that, I can set up for free with Calm Mind until it poisons me with Toxic, because Mewtwo has a Pecha Berry. I get lucky because Skarmory misses Steel Wing along the way, but it does hit two more times, so at plus four, I decide to start my sweep. After all, look at Mewtwo's special attack. It's reached 765. What a beast. Flamethrower 1 hits the Skarmory, as you'd expect, then Steven sends in his Cradley. Flamethrower is only neutral here, so I should switch into Ice Beam, but I don't, and as a result, it survives my one hit, but it only uses Ingrain, and then I knock it out the next turn. His ace, Metagross, comes out next, and Flamethrower 1 hits it. Ice Beam takes the Claydol out, Flamethrower knocks Aggron out, and last is Armaldo, the, uh, steel bug type, right? Steven is a steel trainer, after all. Because of its typing, I go for Flamethrower, and it just barely doesn't KO. The right choice here was obviously to use Psychic because it gets the same type of attack bonus, and it would have finished the Armaldo off in a single hit. But even with a full restore, my next attack takes it out, and Mewtwo finishes the game in a time of 2 hours, 11 minutes, and 24 seconds, with 18 resets at level 59. All of this took 7 hours and 20 minutes of game time. Let's compare these results with the other Pokemon Emerald playthroughs that I've released on the channel so far. I rank this list based on the real time it took me to complete the game with each Pokemon, but I try to include as many metrics as I can, so you can make your own conclusions about which Pokemon deserves which rank. Rayquaza is still first because it had a faster real time than Mewtwo. Coincidentally, they tied with the same number of resets. However, Mewtwo finished the game at the lowest level yet. It was 3 levels lower than Rayquaza, and 15 levels lower than the Pokemon that are in 3rd place for lowest level of completion now. By the way, those two are Absol and Ludicolo. For game time, it was also slightly slower than Rayquaza, so today, Mewtwo earns the second spot in my leaderboard. One thing I'll note here is that I did play Mewtwo the day after I played Rayquaza, so I had slightly more experience for this playthrough. My conclusion is that Mewtwo is slightly less intuitive to play than Rayquaza, and a few things surprised me along the way. Specifically, the first trainer with his Poochiana delayed Mewtwo a lot. Then, later on, my struggles against Flannery and Sydney were surprising. Mewtwo also struggles because it only has access to Confusion for a large portion of the game, whereas Rayquaza gets powerful moves much earlier on. Still, I think the verdict is out though. Maybe in the future, we'll have to see these two go head to head in another video to determine which one is truly the superior solo playthrough Pokemon for Pokemon Emerald. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta read them all. Thanks to my patrons and YouTube members for their support. If you made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.